Okay, hello everyone and good morning. I know it's still early probably uh, to start our session this morning. Thank you very much for attending, uh, everyone attending with us tonight, today. So welcome everyone to the PDA um, session. Today we're going to talk about the PDA members leading change for an anti-racist pharmacy sector. So my name is Hala, I'm a pharmacist, um, I work in Gatwick Airport and I am a PDAU rep for the whole London stations and airport and as well I was elected for the South East as well community pharmacy. Today we are joined by the panelists, let's all welcome our panelists. We have Sharifat Kamal who is a locum and senior specialist pharmacist and vice president of the PDA, BAME network, NHS COVID vaccination center. That's a small like introduction about Sharifat. Then we have Shruti Patel, who is a clinical pharmacist in GP practice and PDA regional committee member in field unity PCN and PDA. We have Manuela is over there and Manuela is a PDA BAME network coordinator, the Pharmacist Defense Association. So we're going to start with Sharifat. Sharifat is a locum and senior specialist as we said, a pharmacist. She's the vice president of the PDA BAME. Thank you very much, uh, Sherry Fat Network, and is a member of the PDA South East Regional Committee representing locums. So if anyone is a locum here, can go to Sherry Fat today. Um, Sherry Fat as well is going to give an overview of the BAME Network and what the committee has done since they've been elected. So let's all welcome Sherry Fat. Thank you. Thank you, Hala, for that beautiful introduction. <laughs> I read too much for me. And good morning, everyone. And welcome again to this edition of BAME, uh, PDA BAME um, event today. My name is Sharifat, as she has said, I'm the Vice President of the BAME Network for the PDA Group. Today, we're going to talk about the BAME Network. The BAME Network was launched in April 2000, and with, at the moment, we are one of the largest networks within the PDA Committee's network. The committee members consist of the president, the vice president, and the honorary secretary. The president is the is Ernst Gomez, and we have um, Dorothy Egede as the uh, honorary secretary, and I'm the vice president. And over the last two years, we have done um, we have uh, done so many activities. I will say so many activities to engage, support our members. Some of which are we have provided a safe place to network during our event, where members can contribute. Members can discuss, members can um, highlight what we need to do, members can come together, have a, like a focus group during our event. What are the aims of the network? The aims of the network is to engage BAME members, to support them with their experiences within their workforce. Maybe they're in the community pharmacy, uh, hospital pharmacy, or they're working within the industry, wherever they are, if they are PDA mem BAM members, will be able to support them if they need anything to help with. And what are those activities that we've been doing over the last couple of years? No, number one, we provided this event networks. And the most thing, the one that is a bit loud is the COVID vaccination campaign. And why this was a bit loud was the fact that most of the people that were affected by COVID are black minority or ethnic backgrounds. And because most of us as pharmacists were at the front line of this COVID issues, so we find it very important for us to raise this campaign so that it will support us, our community and our patients as well. And that was how we have this large um, intrusive um, COVID, uh, COVID campaign led by Manuela. Thank you very much Manuela for organizing that for us. And one of the important events that we had, again, is the one with the, uh, that we, uh, we sit down and discuss about the civil reports, where we realize and we continue, to, we echo this within the event that the report actually caused a lot of division rather than bringing us together. And the Black um, History Month event with the Roger Klein focuses more on recruitment career progression, where most of the summary says more about us being able to come out, talk about what we feel rather than hiding it, speak up, and if you have any issue regarding to recruitment, career progression, and we know that this is affecting us because of our color or our race, we should be able to say it out to others, to people that need them. 
Then we also have a lot of news letters. We produce news letters that contain so many issues that affect us, so many issues that can that will support us as BAME members within the community committees, and our fact sheets as well. Manuela is going to talk more about the fact sheets within our, our presentations. We have a lot of fact sheets that specify so many work work tools and tools that what we can use to support ourselves as our BIM members. So what is our aspirations? What do we focus? What do we want to do in future? We want to have a network that focuses on our needs, our priorities, what we need to do to develop ourselves within our color and race so that we can rise within our profession as pharmacists, as pharmacy technicians, as well as pharmacy colleagues our administrative staff as well. So one of the things we plan to do is to try to form of some focus groups that people of like-minded people within hospital pharmacies that have been members, people who, who are community pharmacies that have been members, those are interested that have been members, how can we come together with our color and look at issues that are affecting us and we that to support ourselves. And with that, I will link that statement into Roger Klein's conclusions of his report, which says that in every organization, there should be accountability and there should be strategic approach to our workforce development, which, which, which should approach individual needs of every member of that particular organization, either you're black, you're white, or you're color. So the decision to recruit, the decision for career progression, should include everybody, and there, won't, there shouldn't be any division or focusing on a, a particular part of, a part of ethnic minorities. So these are the things that we've done so far, and these are the events that we've been able to achieve within this little time of period that we've been executives of um, the PDA BIM um, committee. Thank you very much for listening. And um, I think after some time, we'll be able to have some questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry Fat, for the informative presentation about the work of the BAME PDA network. And uh, now we're going to introduce Shuriti who is a highly motivated clinical pharmacist with us today in a GP practice in Enfield, uh, North London. Her pharmacy career initially started in community, probably I don't know how many community pharmacies, how many community pharmacies we have in this uh, session? Okay, how many f uh, hospitals? PCNs? Any others? Technicians? <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you very much for all joining us. So, and she has now been in primary care for over three years. Shiruti will talk about her experience of discrimination in pharmacy and what she thinks can be done to bring about change. So let's welcome all Shiruti. Thank you, Hela, for that lovely um, introduction. Um, hi, everyone. So I've actually been very fortunate to have never experienced discrimination within pharmacy, both in my community and GP roles. However, we do know that it does happen. We live in a society where patterns of discrimination and inequality dominate life chances, health status, education, housing, justice and employment. Statistics from the 2019 GPHC register revealed that 45 percent of pharmacists are from a BAME background, so that's almost half of all pharmacists. Last week I tweeted for any BAME pharmacists in the UK to share their stories, um, if they've experienced discrimination in the pharmacy sector, what the experiences were and if they got any support. I received eight responses within five hours and some of you might think that's not that many, but that's eight too many. Also I don't have that many followers, <laughs> so that says a lot. Um, and that's not even taking into account of people that um, wouldn't want to share the stories. So the eight responses were based in mainly in hospital and community. Pharmacists were called racist names. They were told that they couldn't understand English based on the way they looked. They were told that they were more likely to catch COVID in staff meetings with no substantial basis. Um, colleagues laughed at their names. Um, or said that their names were, were too hard to pronounce. Uh, and some pharmacists were abused by patients in front of senior members and nothing was done about this, even to the point where pharmacists were not allowed to go to certain hospital wards 
or um, start their diplomas when other less qualified non-BAME members were allowed to do that. Sadly, a lot of these people left their jobs um, and some did not seek support from seniors or take things further as they were scared that they wouldn't be able to achieve certain positions in their careers. Some were not told of outcomes of their concerns. Many were locums in community who felt that they didn't really have anyone to turn to and they felt like they couldn't really speak to the managers at the pharmacies they worked in. Sadly, some of these incidents occurred in front of other BAME colleagues and some of them just tried to water it down and said, um, you know, we're, we're just used to this or you, you kind of have to just get on with it, which is not obviously not the right attitude. There was a lot of discussion from this tweet and some colleagues highlighted that it, it's not just the abuse but the lack of opportunities and career progression in the BAME pharmacist group. I feel that racism and discrimination is not talked about enough in the um, pharmacy sector and I believe that we need to talk about, about it more to bring about change. This includes speaking up when you're experiencing discrimination yourself and escalating it but also speaking up when you see other people experiencing it because we would do it for our patients so why do we not do it for ourselves or our colleagues i think also sometimes people are unsure if a, a comment is racist or, or if a remark is racist um, and that's why it's important to be a part of a network such as the pda bame network um, because they can be very helpful as you can seek further help and support from the team the, B the PDA BAME network is a safe space for pharmacists to voice their concerns and work together to tackle discrimination. They raise awareness of issues impacting BAME pharmacists, help achieve equality in the workplace and represent pharmacy amongst BAME organisations. The PDA as an organisation itself has been supporting many members who have experienced racism and discrimination but often due to uh, confidentiality clauses, many of these cases cannot be discussed. There was a PDA survey in 2020 based on abuse where more than 1,200 responses were received in a week and this included pharmacists um, receiving abuse through racism. In 2018, information from the GPHC found that BAME pharmacists are more likely to face fitness practice panels and it was the president of our PDA BAME network, Elsie Gomez, who um, requested this information from the GPHC under the Freedom of Information request, and she shared it with us at the PDA. This is why I chose to get involved and why I'm a member of the PDA BAME network, as they've done some great work so far. I've been involved in the Get Vaccinated campaign, where I um, made a video encouraging people to get vaccinated in Gujarati. They have also produced a fact sheet, which I believe Manuela is going to speak more about, uh, to help PDA members and others in the profession to educate themselves on terminology used when discussing race and ethnicity. As a PDA regional committee member, equality in the pharmacy sector as a whole is very important to me, so that black, Asian and minority ethnic pharmacists can realise their full potential and raise their profile, and I hope to see more and more BAME pharmacists in leadership roles. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Shirti, for the informative presentation uh, about your experience of discrimination in pharmacy. So now we're going to present Manuela, and who works for the PDA as an organizing um, assistant and has been the coordinator of the BAME network since it's first launched over two years. Well done. Uh, she has experience in member engagement and recruitment and has led many network um, activities, um, including speaking at numerous events, including the PDA race report and PDA get vaccinated events. So Manuel will talk about how the BAME network has grown and how members can join the network and get involved. So if anyone want to join the network, go to Manuela today, yeah? After this, so I'll go there. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Welcome, Manuela, thank you. So, I'm just gonna tell you a bit about the PDA Babe Network and how it's grown over the last two years. So, in the last two years, the PDA BAME network has grown quite significantly and it currently sits as PDA's largest EDI network. 
Um, and it's a testament to the work that the committee have been doing over the past year and a half, you know, with some activities including um, surveying our members um, and just having networking events where we can discuss issues and creating safe spaces for them as um, Sheriff had mentioned. And we've also um, not only allowed them to share their life experiences, but we had webinars where we discussed key issues. We um, contributed to consultations and we wrote several news um, letters. And I also believe that the strength of the PDA Bay Network relies on the wins and successes of its members. And I think that's one thing the PDA Network does quite well is to capture those successes, rave about them. And um, not only have we highlighted them through different newsletters, website articles written by members and other publications, but we've also given them a platform to stand on and speak and share their experiences before pharmacists, fellow pharmacists. And then last year we had an event with Roger Klein in celebration of Black History Month. And for those who don't know, Roger Klein is a research fellow at Middlesex University and has done some extensive work around discrimination in the workplace. And at the event, he talked about his no more ticks boxes um, research, which evidenced six essential criteria upon which, if implemented in a workplace, it will lead to fairer recruitment processes and career progression for all staff, especially those from a BAME background. And that will ultimately lead to a change in behavior and culture. And that coupled with some results from our PDA BAME network, which identified racism, lack of representation in leadership positions, and lack of career progression opportunities for most uh, PDA BAME staff, it gave us a focus as a committee on what to tackle next. And after the event, members could see that there was a real need for BAME leadership and for pharmacists to create an anti-racist working environment. So that is why the PDA BAME network created the PDA Anti-Racist Pharmacy Toolkit. And this is what I'll be talking to you about today. So the goal of this PDA Anti-Pharmacist um, Toolkit is to empower, to equip, and to help members to lead a sector that challenges racism, but also becomes anti-racist, and is reflective of its diverse workforce. I'm sure the PDA, you know, would defend you and represent you whenever you have any cases of discrimination at work. But there was a real need for members and pharmacists themselves to come together using Roger Klein's research to create an anti-racist sector for pharmacists, starting with their own employers. And the most effective way to address inequality at work is through union organization in the workplace where you can influence policy together, strengthen the voice of pharmacists, collectivize issues, and together challenge and hold your employer to account. So, a little bit about the toolkit. So the toolkit should help reps, members, and pharmacists come together, work together, assess their workplaces and members' feelings, and decide on which elements of Roger Klein's research require work or development to create an anti-racist workplace environment. The toolkit includes a fact sheet, um, which has been referenced a few times. It includes Roger Klein's six essential criteria. It includes a member questionnaire and an um, employer questionnaire, and an action plan and a charter for employers. And the toolkit would briefly look something like this. So first, as a member, you want to identify the issues in your workplace. So you will go on the working with members section of the toolkit, download the member survey, and then based on the questions, based on the responses from your pharmacist, your fellow pharmacist on the questionnaire, you should have a better understanding of the issue as well as strength of feeling of members. And then secondly, you will ask your employer to fill in the employer questionnaire. And this would help you assess the types of measures your employer have taken to create an anti-racist working environment, if any at all. And depending on the answers of both questionnaires, you should be able to identify and narrow down the issue and see if there is scope for a campaign. So let us hypothetically say that you've filled in a member survey questions while your members, pharmacists, are filled in the survey questions, the employer has done the same, and you were able to narrow down the issue to lack of BAME pharmacist recruitment. 
Step two of the toolkit would be to refer back to Roger Klein's six essential criteria and select which one applies to your workplace. And in this case, it would be debiasing processes in recruitment. So what does Roger Klein say about debiasing processes? He says that we must carefully vet the recruitment process for bias, that is job description, advertising, scoring, shortlisting, etc., and then find out at which stage did stereotyping and bias creep in. Step three would then be to implement the action plan um, which is a template that was provided for you guys and it will help you to develop a set of activities to help tackle the issue. And it's important to know that whilst Roger Klein's six essential criteria provides the theoretical framework, the other materials in this toolkit should be able to help you bring it to life and make it practical in your own workplaces. So, in closing, the PDA's anti-racist pharmacy toolkit is a standalone piece to empower and to empower reps and active network members to lead change locally in their workplaces and in their employers and together begin to develop an anti-racist pharmacy sector. So I ask that if you are a pharmacist today, please join the PDA and please join our PDA Bay network to have a collective voice and get involved in helping to lead an anti-racist pharmacy sector by using the PDA Anti-Racist Pharmacy Toolkit. Please share best practice and feedback on activities on what reps and members have been doing in their own employer, in their own workplaces to create an anti-racist working environment. And lastly, I would like to invite you all to the PDA pharmacist at the PDA anti-racist pharmacy launch, which will be sometime in the summer. So please look out for further details and I hope to see you all there. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Manuela, for the informative presentation about members can join and get involved. So as she said, if anyone wants to get involved, go to Manuela after this session. Um, so I'm really excited as well to attend the PDA Anti-Racist uh, Pharmacy Toolkit. So I'm really excited to attend this, this event. And now I'm going to open the ground for any questions for the panelists. So it will be good to have your questions and then uh, hopefully we'll take, we have, we left some time, you know, for people to join us. So yeah, we have the first gentleman there. Hi, um, considering that you mentioned that 45% of the registrants um, identify as BAME, um, is there any work that's being done to um, tackle this with the NHS organizations? Because you see lots of pharmacists in junior positions, but we don't see that diversity being reflected in the senior leadership team. So is there anything, is there any work that's being done to address that? Who would like to take that question? Yeah, I can take it. Take it. Manuela? Yeah. Oh, it's my icon. Yeah, um, yeah this PD anti-racist toolkit is actually one of those initiatives. Um, it was tested out by Roger Klein in various NHS organizations, and he's got extensive you know, examples of organizations that have actually tried it and have seen some successes. So this is a member-led initiative, and we want you know, members to take it to their own workplaces and begin to start that conversation and begin to implement these things so we can see active change. So we one of the toolkit is one of the ways that we are using to address this issue next question Sorry. hello uh, my name is Dennis Mayerson from Birmingham I work for Birmingham Mental Health Trust um, on a positive point I do work for the trust Birmingham Mental Health Trust and they are in the process of being more diversified so to me that's a positive thing so whatever you're doing it is working Thank you. Like to do that one? Thank you. Hello, Sneha Varia, uh, CPP. I just wanted to ask. It's good to have strategies. What, what do you think, also needs to happen to ensure that that strategy delivers dignity and respect for our cultural differences? What else needs to change? What is the role of education from your perspective? Sharifat, are you going to? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So it's just working? I hope it's working. It's not on. No, it's it? not working. It's, it's not, not working. Okay, okay, that's fine. Can you hear me? Just turn I think it's not. Is it? Okay. Do you want to speak from here? Yeah? I know we're going to have this problem. <laughs> Um, hello. Yeah. Okay, this is fine. Um, I think we there's so many things that need to change, and that is one of the process while we're having this toolkit that Manuela is just talking about. And we know in process at the moment we have a lot of trust that are having a lot of uh, discussion using the Roger Klein's um, conclusion. So we're having a lot of discussions, and, and the head of trust and NHS eight. Um, race and equality networks too, they're working around it as well. So with education, it's about continuing to educate people to come forward. Um, who is not in the room? Maybe in the workplace we have uh, 10 people, then here we can see just one color. So look for the other person. I mean, when we send out um, career um, recruitment paperwork, we need to find out, put it in there. People that are supposed to come in, they're not there, we have to look for them. But sometimes speaking out becomes a problem because you don't want to be victimized. So we say the line managers, senior managers, look out for those people that are supposed to be there that are not there. So it's just, just looking out across the room, who's supposed to be here? Who's supposed to go to the next person, maybe nine or ten that's not supposed to be here? I mean, bringing them forward, even if they, even if they are not coming forward. So inclusiveness is more important. Marala, you want to add something here? Can I just add to that as well? You mentioned education, and I yeah. think... That's one thing that Roger Klein emphasizes in his, um, in his research. It's about leaders being educated about their own biases. So he places a lot of ownership on the leaders. So I think education will also come, come from, from that side. Is that right? Uh, next, uh, here. Oh, okay. um, so yeah, I just want to say thanks for this session. I think it's really important to obviously be able to highlight it. And I think one of the main ways is to make it like talk about it more publicly and also just what you've just said now is that this is they should they shouldn't just be BAME people here it should be the non-BAME as well like that's also the audience one thing I wanted to ask is that so in regards to this toolkit I'm curious to know if you've had any data in regards to people that have utilized the toolkit and what the responses have been from like leadership because as much as I think this toolkit is an amazing idea and I would love to be able to obviously um, Kind of pass it down to our to our trust but i feel like there's going to be a bit of like resistance because like we just mentioned earlier we don't have being in leadership positions so i feel sometimes i feel like that's where the resistance is because if you don't have someone there that's going to be talking for you or leading for you then i don't know how the outcomes of this toolkit would be like implemented so i just wanted to know if there's if you know of any trusts or anywhere that they've used this toolkit and how they've implemented any changes that have come from it thanks thank you i can manuela yeah i can answer that so um the toolkit would actually include some case studies from um some nhs trusts i know i think buckinghamshire nhs trust they, according to Roger Klein, I think he sent me some, some of his um, case studies, I think they completely revamped the way they recruit their directors. So they've carefully looked at the job descriptions, you know, how they shortlist them, the scoring. So that's one of the examples I can provide to you. But the toolkit will actually include lots more case studies. Thank you. Hi, so first of all I want to say a massive thank you because that's really inspiring to, from all of you to share your experience and seeing people of colour is really important for other people to be able to say if I can see it I can be it and a big shout out for the fact that it's an all female panel, <laughs> that, that means a lot to me, <laughs> that is not a question. So my question was about um, workforce race equality standards, so Roger Klein, his seminal paper made workforce race equality standards in the NHS and in secondary care come into force. We don't have anything like that in community pharmacy and given that PDA is a union, do you think that there is potential for you to lobby employers in community to have something similar, so a pharmacy workforce race equality standards in community pharmacy? And you may not be able to answer that but it's maybe something to take away and have a discussion about. Yes. Um, um, Yes, Sam, we are, we are going into this um, sort of scenario, so we are into, the PDA is planning to do exactly. that. Exactly, so. so, yeah. 
So yes, the answer is yes. We, <laughs> yes, I mean something we put in pipeline, right? something we have to discuss, and that's one of the purpose of this network. I mean to be able to see where the gaps are and bring them forward, and together we work towards it and put it, spread it out to the right channel that can support the process. So good question. So yes, we are in the process. So we have uh, Jay. Hi. Question. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you uh, for the talk. It's very interesting and uh, very passionate. Um, I, I've had um, over 20 years career in the NHS and before that I was in community pharmacy um, and as part of my role in the NHS I was a, a chair of the BME and Sussex CCGs. Um, what I've come across and, and I think you probably, it probably resonate with you is that um, you know all the organizations in the NHS and other organizations I've worked with be it private have very, very good uh, policies against racism. Um, and, and, and in some cases, they are very active. The problem that I've come across, which is really, really difficult and challenging, and, and for years I've, I've come across this problem, which is that explicitly the policies are always there, but implicitly, i.e. The, the culture of the organization is where it stops. And, and to give you an example of that, um, the Sussex CCGs that I worked with had excellent policies in terms of um, interviewing skills and adopting interviews. And, and in fact, in some cases, especially in senior positions, because there, there were lack of uh, BME representations at senior positions, um, they had me on the interview panel. And my experience with that is that the, fo the policies followed, however, culturally, um, the, the, the behavior is really difficult. And even when I've challenged people on, you know, why they've chosen a certain candidate, um, at the end of the day, the interviews, the interviews are very subjective. And I think this is the most difficult thing to tackle. And, you know, as, as, as my, uh, from my experience, it's one of those things that you might want to consider about how you change the culture of, of people and organizations. Um, you know, you, you can have a conversation about changing their policies and, and make it really robust. But if the, the, the infrastructure is not there and the cultural behavior is not there, unfortunately, it's not going to make the change. So, so it's, it's, I suppose it's not a question, it's more about a comment, but whether you want to comment on that as well. Anyone? I, I can comment on it. Um, you mentioned culture, and I think I mentioned it in my, in my presentation as well. Um, and you are right, there are many organizations with lots of policies, and I think Roger Klein says that policies alone and training alone in isolation won't make a difference. It's about debiasing processes, and that's what the toolkit is about. It's about equipping members to go to the employers and start to think about how you know, leaders themselves, and I mentioned it earlier, can start thinking about their own biases, how they can implement a culture of compassion, of, of, of equality, you know, starting from the top all the way to the bottom. So um, it, it's highlighted in, in, in the toolkit, and I, I do agree with you. And um, to add on to what she has just said, one of the things that we have, we have generally echoed is about speaking up. I mean, I know sometimes it's a bit um, not comfortable, but wherever you feel it's comfortable to speak up, you feel comfortable to speak to, or write to, at least um, we, we encourage that as much as possible. But that will support us and support the generation coming after us. And I think so. This session is here for to know to let people to, to to have more education about what's going on as well about racism and anti-racism because I mean this is the first time we have a session like that. So it's important I think so for we come together and everyone makes a difference and we can make a big difference all together because it takes more than one person to make a difference normally to make a change. Um, anyone else? No. No more questions. That's it. Everyone want to go? Okay, then we're going to close this session then. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. As we say, this is the beginning, so we can all go to come together and work on the policies to deliver what we need to deliver. And the launch will be soon for the anti-racist uh, tool if you want to be aware and see what's going on. And um, thank you very much. Any other questions? The panelists are here. Thank you all for attending. Thank you very much. <laughs>